Hi, welcome to Educator.com. We're going to talk about ANOVA with independent samples today. So first, uh, we need to talk a little bit about why we need to introduce the ANOVA. We've been doing so well with t-tests so far, right? Um, well, there are some limitations of the t-test, and that's why we're going to need an ANOVA here. Um, an ANOVA is also called the analysis of variance, and the analysis of variance is really also um, could be thought of as the omnibus hypothesis test. So it's still a hypothesis test, just like the t-test, but um, it's the omnibus hypothesis test, and we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to need to go over a little bit of notation in order to talk, break down what the ANOVA entails. And then we're really going to get to the nitty gritty of partitioning or analyzing variance, right? Like getting down and breaking apart variance into its component parts. Then we're going to build up the F statistic made up of those uh, bits and pieces of variances. And then finally talk about how that relates to the F distribution and hypothesis testing. Okay, so first thing, the limitations of the t-test. Well, here's, here's a common problem. Like, we might want to know this question, you know? Who uploads more pictures to Facebook? Latino users, white users, Asian users, or black Facebook users, right? Which of these uh, racial or ethnic groups um, uploads more pictures to Facebook? Well, let's see what would happen if we used independent samples t-tests. What would we have to do? Well, we'd have to compare Latinos to whites, Latinos to Asians, Latinos to blacks, and then whites to Asians, and whites to blacks, and Asians to blacks, right? And it's like, whoa, all of a sudden, we have to do six different independent samples t-tests. That's a lot of tiny, tiny little t-tests. And really, the more t-tests you do, that increases your likelihood of type 1 error. Previously, to calculate uh, type 1 error, we looked at... Um, 1 minus the probability that you would be correct, right? So 1 minus the uh, probability of being right. And that was something like 0.05, let's say, right? Um, but now that we want to calculate the probability of type 1 errors for six t-tests, we have to think back to our probability principles. But really, alpha is going to look something like this. 1 minus whatever your correct rate is to the sixth power. And that's going to be a much higher, uh, much higher type 1 error rate than uh, you really want, right? So the problem is that the more t-tests you have, the more, um, the more, the bigger the chance of your type 1 error. And even non-mathematically, you could think about this. Every time you do a t-test, you could reject the null, right? Every time you reject the null, you have a possibility of making a type 1 error, right? And so if you reject the null six times, then you have increased your type 1 error rate because you're just rejecting more null hypotheses. So you should know there are two major limitations of having many, many tiny, tiny little t-tests. So if you have six separate t-tests, one is the increased likelihood of type 1 error, and that's bad, right? We don't want a false alarm. But there's a second problem. You're not using the full set of data in order to estimate S. Remember how before uh, we talked about how S is an estimate of the population standard deviation? Well, it would be nice if we had a good estimate of the population standard deviation. And you know when you have a better estimate of the population standard deviation? When you got more data, right? When you do a t-test, for instance, with uh, Latinos and white people, then you're ignoring your luscious and totally usable data from your Asian and black American population, right? So that's a problem. You're ignoring some of your data in order to estimate S. And you're estimating S a bunch of different little times instead of having one sort of giant estimate of S, which would be a better way to go. So both of these are major limitations of using many, many little t-tests. 